Hello, everybody. It is noon here in Hamilton, Ontario, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome all. I'm Carol Deschim with the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, our CLSA. Thank you for attending the May talk of our ongoing CLSA webinar series. Today, our webinar is Exploring the Geography of Cognitive Function and Social Support Availability, a Spatial Analysis of the CLSA, presented by Dr. Jane Law and Matthew Quick at the University of Waterloo. Before we begin, let's review a couple of housekeeping points. Everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the, sem the seminar. At the end of the presentation, there will be a question and answer session. If you have a question at any time, you can post that question by typing it into the chat box located in the bottom right of the WebEx menu. These questions will then be talked through at the very end of the webinar. Ensure that you select all presenters from the chat drop-down menu before you send a question or a comment. Mobile users, please select chat with everyone. Questions will be visible to all attendees. And please remember to exit the WebEx session at the conclusion of the webinar. Now today's webinar is exploring the geography of cognitive function and social support availability, a spatial analysis of the CLSA. Let me introduce you to our distinguished speakers, Dr. Jane Law and Matthew Quick. Jane Law is an associate professor in the School of Public Health and Health Systems jointly appointed to the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo. She is a professional member of the Geomatics Division of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors in the United Kingdom. She specializes in health geomatics, geographic information systems, spatial statistical analysis, and spatial epidemiology. Dr. Law has conducted research involving longitudinal studies such as European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition when she was a postdoctoral research associate at the University of Cambridge Medical Research Council Biostatistical Unit. She has held the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada Discovery Grant on Spatial Statistical Analysis since 2009. Matthew Quick, who I believe is presenting most of the webinar today, is a PhD candidate and the School of Planning at the University of Waterloo. His research uses spatial and spatial-temporal statistical methods to investigate the relationships between geographical context and social, demographic, and health phenomenon. His work has been published in many prestigious geographical analysis journals. Um, again, before we begin, just remember that there will be a question and answer session moderated by me at the end of the webinar, but feel free at any time to write any questions or any comments during the webinar into the chat box. So now I'd like to uh, ask uh, Matthew Quick to begin the webinar. Thanks, Carol, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Matt Quick. I'm a PhD uh, candidate at the University of Waterloo. And thanks for joining uh, me and everybody uh, today to, to talk about uh, the geography of cognitive function and social support uh, using spatial analysis methods applied to the CLSA data. Now, through the presentation today, I have two broad goals that I'd like to, for the participants to take home with them. And the first is um, that the presentation will illustrate the ways that spatial information uh, can be incorporated into analysis of the CLSA data and broadly how to think about geography in the CLSA. And then second is specifically to focus on how geography helps us understand the relationship between cognitive functioning or the, the processes that through which one becomes aware or comprehends ideas and social support or the, the perception and actuality that one is cared for has assistance from other people. Um, so, but in particular, the objectives for today's presentation are, are first to understand the geography of the CLSA, uh, what sort of geographical data and spatial information is incorporated into the CLSA, how we can incorporate this into analysis, and then challenges associated with it. The second is exploratory, and we're looking at is there overlap between clusters of high cognitive function and high social support, or low cognitive function and low social support, and, and how, to what degree do these areas overlap? And the third, is how does geography help us understand the relationship between cognitive function and social support? What covariates are associated with cognitive function and how much variability is explained by location? Uh, broadly, the outline today, first we're gonna uh, define spatial analysis and, and situate this methodological framework within the public health context. We're gonna outline what type of geographical information is contained within the CLSA and how to use it in analysis. Uh, we'll define cognitive functioning and social support and briefly justify why a geographical lens is useful and helpful in understanding this relationship. And then we'll present two sets, present two sets of analysis. The first is a cluster analysis, exploratory analysis, looking at uh, cognitive functioning, social support, and overlapping clusters using the tracking assessment. And the 
instead of analysis, we'll use uh, the comprehensive, anal comprehensive assessment and fit a set of multi-level regression models that look at the relationship between cognitive function and social support and accounting for a, a number of risk factors. And finally, we'll conclude with some limitations of the, of the research, some challenges, and some future directions. So what is spatial analysis? Uh, spatial analysis focuses on the use of spatial data, which is data where the attribute of interest and its location are, are, are recorded. And broadly, these can be considered two types. There's point data or uh, instances on the earth with X, Y coordinates or latitude, longitude coordinates. Um, for example, individuals, houses or buildings, street intersections, point sources or sensors for pollution, or perhaps sampling locations of fish or trees or something like that. And for point data, we're interested in the attributes of, in of interest, such as where people live, uh, their individual characteristics, their income and their education level, as well as their relationship to other people in space. For area data, we have polygons uh, or you know, areas bounded by lines, uh, most commonly administrative boundaries like neighborhoods or census areas or zip codes. And in, this, in these contexts, we're interested in the characteristics within these areas and how the areas relate to each other. One of the classic examples in spatial epidemiology is lip cancer risk within counties in Scotland, uh, but we could also look at the distance between neighborhoods and, and the city center and cognitive functioning of the people within neighborhoods. And of course, when we're analyzing spatial data, we want to take into account geography or location when we're doing our analysis. And this involves uh, focusing specifically on the relative relationship between data, so where points are in relation to other points. And this follows Tobler's first law of geography, uh, that everything is related to everything else, but near things or closer things are more related than distant things. And we can incorporate these assumptions into analysis. For example, if we're looking at point data, we're looking at air pollution, we can assume that air pollution is a continuous surface over space and that uh, we incorporate geography by a distance decay function where the highest pollution is from the point source and it decreases as we move farther away. So if we're looking at aerial data or neighborhoods, we can assume that nearby areas have similar levels of income, but that, that, that neighborhoods at a farther distance have less similar levels of income. Here's an example of spatial data from, uh, this was created in a GIS software. And, uh, oops, sorry. There we go. Um, and you can see here points are in light blue and points are located within areas which are shaded in purple. So for example, uh, we could use, um, the points might be individuals and each individual has cognitive functioning associated with it. And then each individual is located with an area. An area has certain attributes as well, like income and like education level. So broadly, spatial analysis can be divided into two analytical approaches. The first is exploratory. And here we're looking at patterns of data. We look at a single variable. And one example is cluster detection. And cluster detection is commonly used in public health applications, including uh, disease surveillance of where there's clusters of flu emerging. Uh, and the second is confirmatory spatial data, data analysis, which uses frequently regression models and we're concerned about making inferences on covariates or relationships between outcomes and explanatory variables. And one example in the spatial context is uh, spatial regression. So exploratory methods attempt to describe a phenomenon, describe its pattern, whereas confirmatory spatial methods try to explain it. In public health contexts, and I'll be using this sort of method through the presentation, we often have multi-level data where individuals are nested within neighborhoods. Historically, to the best of my knowledge, public health research has often looked at individual level data uh, and looking at risk factors and outcomes at the individual level. Uh, but increasingly, the literature has uh, identified that contextual group level or area level risk factors also influence individual health outcomes above and beyond individual characteristics. So combining these two levels, the individual nested within areas naturally leads to a multi-level design. 
uh, compared to, for example, analyzing only individuals or analyzing only groups. So here I've illustrated a graphic. Uh, we have individuals, and each of these individuals has different levels of cognitive functioning. Each individual has a different level of social support. They're different ages. They have different levels of educational attainment. And they're all located within different neighborhoods. And these neighborhoods can be characterized by uh, the housing type, whether or not they're located in the central city, their access to green space, population density, and so forth. And so the goal of multi-level data analysis is to quantify how important these contextual or area level characteristics are to understanding individual health outcomes. So when we move multi-level data into an analytical framework, uh, we have multi-level analysis, which is the study of the effects of collective or group characteristics on individual level outcomes. So this comes from a starting point that individual health, health is shaped by individual characteristics and area level characteristics. And when we think about this, we can think about it broadly as place or space. So the classic geography talk uh, where place is group membership. So we have level one people or individuals within shared geographical units. So myself and my family live within one neighborhood and yourself and your family within, live within a different neighborhood. Uh, and these units are state and region or um, neighborhoods or schools or families. They don't necessarily need to be geog geographical. For today, we consider them as zip codes. Uh, and then space is the relationship between these areas. So how neighborhoods are located next to each other or far away from each other, how they're located relative to the city center or in suburban areas. Um, broadly, multi-level methods can be considered, uh, are often um, used in the neighborhood effects literature or the literature that tries to develop theoretical models of disease that explain how group level and individual level variables interact in shaping health outcomes. And specifically in the cognitive functioning literature, few studies use multi-level methods. Uh, some of that might be a data availability issue, um, uh, but typically most of the variability has been found between individuals rather than between areas. Uh, and some characteristics, just quite briefly, uh, some area level characteristics associated with cognitive functioning include educational attainment on average, socioeconomic status or socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, and, and poverty or income. So now that we've got a handle on spatial data and we're gonna think about how to incorporate geography and location within uh, analyses, let's look at how ge geography is incorporated in uh, the CLSA data. So broadly, the CLSA data has a handful of geographical information uh, fields. Um, one is province. The next is census subdivision, which are municipalities. Uh, the third is the data collection site. This is for the comprehensive assessment only. And there's 11 sites, including Victoria, Calgary, Hamilton, and Montreal. And then the most precise or most granular geographic level is the forward sortation area. And that is the three character postal code. And this is included in both tracking and comprehensive assessments. So for example, a forward sortation area would be K6V or N2H. Uh, and those are very in size throughout the country. And each unit of geography has attributes that you can assign to it and you can look at in analyses. For example, at the province level, we could look at healthcare funding or certain programs. At the census subdivision or municipality level, we could look at air pollution or manufacturing or industry. And at the forward sortation area, we could look at whether or not an area is located in, a, in rural areas or urban areas and as well as characteristics available from the census, like income, ethnic composition, or educational attainment. So the next slide shows an example of uh, forward sortation areas in Kitchener-Waterloo. So you can see, uh, this is the University of Waterloo right here, and it is located within a forward sortation area. Uh, conceptually, in this analysis that I'll present today, we have individuals nested within forward sortation areas. And because uh, there's no more precise or more granular spatial information, we assume that each individual is located at the centroid or the geographical center of each area. Examples, this might be a centroid, that might be a centroid, and that might be a centroid. This doesn't really change our inferences at the area level, but it would have implications if we had more detailed information at the individual level. Uh, forward sortation areas, as you can see from this map, are often contiguous 
areas. They cover the entirety of Canada, but they vary greatly in size, typically along an urban and rural divide where urban forward sortation areas are smaller and rural areas are much larger. And, and postal codes are, or forward sortation areas are commonly used in public health research because this data is sensitive and reporting individual locations isn't uh, wanted. An important thing to note when we're analyzing forward sortation areas, as we'll do in this study, is that they aren't necessarily representative of a neighborhood or an activity space or a meaningful unit of analysis at the individual level. This is a common uh, limitation of geographical analysis at the area level, um, given data limitations and uh, financial limitations on collecting data. So it's a question about which scale of analysis, if we have a choice, is most optimal to represent sort of exposure to different contexts and different geographical areas. Within the CLSA, uh, there's two assessments, the tracking assessment and the comprehensive assessment. And the tracking assessment was done by phone, collected for all the provinces, and it's about 20,000 participants distributed over just over 1,500 forward sortation areas. Uh, that's about on average 13 participants per forward rotation area, but this varies dramatically through the sample. The second assessment is the comprehensive assessment, and this is collected within 11 data collection sites in Canada. Um, there's more participants in this sample, 30,000 participants, and this is distributed over a smaller number of forward rotation areas, about 500. This leads to about 60 participants per forward rotation area. So the implications for analysis when we're considering the tracking assessment and the comprehensive assessment is that the tracking assessment likely has more noise when we're analyzing at the area level because there's fewer participants, whereas the comprehensive assessment may have more signal coming out of the individuals up to the area level. The second thing to consider is that the tracking assessment, because it's collected across Canada, has very heterogeneous forward rotation area sizes or area like kilometer squared of the forward sortation areas. We have very large rural areas that capture almost half of a province in some cases versus very small urban forward sortation areas in cities like Toronto or Vancouver. And this raises an, a handful of challenges with, with geographical analysis, and I'll discuss these more later. But uh, one of the assumptions we make is that internally within each forward sortation area, that the characteristics are relatively homogenous, that people have the same exposure within that area. Of course, when you have very large areas, that assumption might be violated. When we have large areas in the tracking assessment, we also question the assumption that nearby areas are more related to other areas because the internal homogeneity is very different. And this has implications for uh, how we interpret what neighborhoods mean, what forward rotation areas mean, and how we measure variables at that level. To give an example of the differences between the tracking data set and the comprehensive data set, I've, I've extracted some, some sample sizes here um, from each assessment uh, in Ottawa, or Ottawa Gatineau, rather. Um, and you can see here, this is approximately the Ottawa River. And I can delineate that because in the comprehensive data set, uh, we have data collected for Ottawa, but not Gatineau. And in the tracking assessment, we have data collected for Ottawa and Gatineau. It's collected across the country. So you can see here, for example, this area has 58 participants, and the same area in the tracking assessment has one participant. Uh, for reference, this area is about five kilometers squared or so in area. So it's clear that there are many more respondents per FSA in the comprehensive assessment. So now uh, I've laid out some principles of, of uh, geographical analysis of spatial data. And so far what I've talked about in terms of the, the comprehensive and the tracking assessment can be applied um, to any, any uh, analysis of CLSA data. And, and now I'm gonna specifically focus on cognitive functioning and social support. And first we're gonna consider the role that geography plays in understanding each of them separately. We'll separately analyze cognitive function and separately analyze social support and look for overlapping clusters. And then the second set of analysis will consider how geography and how spatial information helps us to understand the relationship between cognitive function as our outcome and social support as our explanatory variable or risk factor. So cognitive function is the process uh, 
through which one becomes aware of or comprehends the ideas. And, and cognitive function is important because it's a precursor to Alzheimer's and other dementias. It's a, a source of impairment in activities of daily living. It requires considerable informal caregiving or formal caregiving and, and, and leads to institutionalized care and that's costly in the long run. So if we can better understand how to reduce cognitive decline, uh, perhaps via social support, we can eliminate these, uh, these problems. So broadly, uh, literature has found support that uh, social support is associated with physical and mental health outcomes, including, including cognitive function. And this is uh, uh, cross-sectional. So at one point in time, high social support is associated with high cognitive functioning and longitudinal, where high social support reduces the rate of decline of cognitive functioning. Uh, it's also associated with physical health outcomes like cardiovascular disease and hypertension. And social support comes in many forms. Uh, for example, emotional support or the things that make us feel loved or cared for. Uh, instrumental support or the tangible support to so help with housekeeping or providing transportation. And informational support or offering advice, providing information, perhaps how to access healthcare. Uh, so some of the mechanisms through which social support influences cognitive functioning, I've listed on the slide. And often these are complex and they interact. Uh, but for example, engaging in social activities via your social support networks fosters communication and interactions. This stimulates your brain and increases synapsogenesis. Your brain cells work more efficiently or take over the functions of affected cells. Uh, we also have positive emotions through social support. So talking to somebody or, or reconciling um, your emotions with somebody uh, at least a more positive self-image protects against stress and anxiety, and this is reduces your cardiovascular reactivity, your blood pressure and heart rate. Uh, we also have research showing that social support and social networks facilitates physical activity, which also reduces stress and anxiety and, and benefits cognitive function, as well as other risk factors associated with cognitive function. So situating this research geographically, we consider how Oh, the characteristics of one's living environment influences cognitive functioning. And, and recall that this comes from the neighborhood effects literature and multi-level models that individuals have exposures that are beyond themselves, that behaviors and risk factors are due to individuals as well as their group setting. And geography is particularly important for older adults because they often have mobility constraints, uh, such as limited capacity to drive, they spend relatively more time in their local environments. They're more dependent on local resources and services. So they're more closely tied to the walkability or the food environment or the shops and banks nearby. Uh, they typically have fewer contacts with social network members. So they have relatively stronger associations or they have rel str relatively stronger exposures to the local environment. But situating the map or the mechanisms through which social support influences cognitive functioning geographically, so putting them through a spatial lens. Um, somehow, uh, neighborhoods or areas have to get into the body and influence the processes, the, the direct processes that influence cognitive functioning. Uh, the first is engaging in social activities. And past work has shown that areas with relatively higher proportions of adults have better cog the adults, sorry, Older adults that live in neighborhoods with higher proportions of older adults have better cognitive functioning, perhaps due to better service availability, policies or, or programs targeting areas with high concentrations of older adults, but also based on social network uh, performance or social network formation within these areas. Uh, in certain areas, they may have greater number and higher quality of resources and amenities that encourage physical activity and social activity, uh, and also the built environment. Um, the quality and the design of the living environment, the safety and, and walkability are associated with physical activity. If, if an area is unsafe, people may withdraw and experience social isolation. And the built environment, the walkability, also facilitates access to services and amenities like parks and libraries that serve as sites for cognitive stimulation and also physical activity. Um, and this has been recognized in past work, finding that land use mix and walkability are positively associated with cognitive functioning and memory recall. Um, the role of the built environment uh, also shows how or provides some opportunities for interventions. Um, and this is perhaps most 
commonly in the planning literature referred to as age 80 cities, so designing cities and designing neighborhoods so that people aged eight, people age 80 uh, can, can move and, and, and live in those areas well. And, and changes to the physical environment and walkability are relatively long lasting, they influence all individuals and, and can be implemented geographically or targeting specific areas. So focusing now on the data that we've analyzed, and this is data that we analyzed through all of the remainder of the session, uh, is global cognitive functioning. That's our individual level outcome variable. And it's a sum of memory and executive functioning. And memory was operationalized using the Ray auditory verbal learning and delayed recall. And executive functioning is the mental alternation test. So counting uh, numbers and reciting the alphabet and alternating between the two and animal fluency, or as naming as many animals as you can. Uh, and, and this was the average of, of these two Z scores. So the variable centers about at zero. And then our explanatory variable of interest, we, we do analyze others, uh, is overall social support. And this is the combination of emotional, tangible, positive social interaction, and affectionate levels of support. So emotional is your sense of being looked after. Uh, tangible is a concrete way of providing support. Positive. Social interaction is did you share or enjoy a good time with other people? And affectionate support is feeling of being loved or receiving affection. Uh, so it's the average of overall social support is the average of all four of these subscales and the variables center around four. So now I'm gonna provide or uh, show the first set of analysis, uh, which is a spatial cluster analysis. It's exploratory. We're not really making any inferences about the relationships between the two, but just looking at patterns. And, and similarities between uh, cognitive function and social support. And this uses the tracking assessment, and we specifically focus on the forward sourcation area scale. So for this uh, level, this set of analyses got three sort of guiding questions. And the first is methodological. How can we generate area level estimates of cognitive functioning and social support? The second is how important is geography in explaining each of these outcomes? Is geography more important for cognitive functioning or is it more important for social support and why? And question three is where are these clusters located and do areas with high cognitive functioning and high social support overlap? What can this tell us about future analyses, perhaps regression models? Uh, and for this assessment, we use the tracking or for this an analysis, we use the tracking assessment. So here is the data. Uh, this is all of the FSAs included in the tracking assessment. There's about 1,500 areas and about 16,000 participants using the complete cases data. You can see uh, the difference in sizes of areas and one of the limitations of doing analysis using the entire tracking data set, geographical analysis using the entire tracking data set, is we have very small forward sortation areas in the urban areas, but very large in some of the rural areas. I'll talk about more about that later. So here's the data for global cognition and overall social support. See over global cognition mean is about zero and standard deviation of three and overall social support cluster between four and five. So most people have relatively high social support, a mean of 4.3. And so our first question is how do we generate area level estimates? And, and so we use a multi-level model and, and in this case, we fit one individual level covariate using the tracking data set. Um, we have individual level uh, cognitive functioning or social support. They're analyzed separately. And then here we have our individual level variance or the variability explained at the individual level. And then each of our individual level cognitive functioning or social support is explained by an intercept or the average uh, coefficient for rurality, whether or not a uh, person lives in a rural area or not. And then we have the residual effect of being located within a forward sortation area. And this um, was, we don't impose any assumptions on this other than it follows a normal distribution and, and there's some common variance that explains the between area variability. So I've provided the, the interpretation down here if you wanna read that specifically. Uh, for those interested, we implement this in a Bayesian framework, so there's priors, and, and this is just a straightforward way of implementing multi-level models, and I'm happy to talk about this more in the questions, or you can email me personally. 
Um, so we analyze virality and only reality in this context because rural areas are not terribly prevalent in the comprehensive assessment. The comprehensive assessment, if you recall, are collected mostly for urban data collection centers. So there are very few rural areas included in these samples. Uh, past research has suggested, although it's inconclusive, that cognitive functioning is lower in rural areas compared to urban areas, perhaps because urban areas have more complex environments, offer more cognitive stimulation and a greater diversity of experiences. Uh, it also could be due to the measurement tool or that people living in rural areas are less familiar with procedures used in cognitive, cognitive testing. So this shows the results of our, uh, of our analysis of the tracking assessment for across all of Canada, and we analyzed them separately. So you can see that the intercepts uh, broadly align with our, with our data. You can see cognition was centered at zero, so that's about right, and overall social support was average was about 4.3. So the intercepts align with the data. And we can also see here the coefficient estimate for uh, whether or not an, an individual lives in a rural area or not. And we can see that virality is associated with uh, global cognition. So people who live in rural areas have lower global cognition, slightly lower, and, uh, but there's no effect on social support. And we can see this because this is the uncertainty interval, 95% interval, and this crosses zero. Whereas this interval is unambiguously negative. So that's at the individual level. At the forward rotation area level, we have our area level estimate. So how much of the individual clustering can be explained at the area level, at the forward rotation area level. And here we see the range of the forward rotation area estimates for global cognition is much greater than for overall social support. This suggests and is confirmed by our variance partition coefficients that areas or geography is much more important for understanding cognition than it is for understanding overall social support. Um, and just to give you some context on these numbers, 2.25% uh, of the variability of cognition is explained by area. Um, past research has found that about 1% of mortality is explained across public health units, 2.5% of respiratory function or blood pressure is explained between districts, uh, about 1% of drinking behaviors are explained between districts. So we're about in line. It's small, but we're about in line with what people have found in past public health literature. Uh, I've just shown the calculation of the variance partition coefficient here, and you can refer back to this slide to, to identify those parameters. So here, the map, finally, right? Uh, so here we've got global cognitive functioning, and uh, we've classified them into tertiles, so areas with the highest forward rotation area estimates or area level estimates and areas with the lowest one third of, of area level estimates. Uh, and the first thing that we can see is that when we're analyzing the tracking data set and we're visualizing these results is the map is dominated by these large rural areas. The second thing we can see is that the pattern is heterogeneous. There's a mixture of high estimates, low estimates, middle estimates throughout the country. But at the regional level, I've sort of identified a couple clusters that might be of interest. The first is much of British Columbia. You can see a lot of it is green or in the high tertile or positively associated with cognitive functioning. You see much of sort of central Ontario has low levels of cognitive functioning. And much of Atlantic Canada also has low levels. I'm not gonna try and, and hypothesize why this might be. This is just simply describing the patterns that are observed. Second, we show overall social support at the area level. And the same interpretation where green is high levels of overall social support and orange is low. But recall that there's a difference here in sort of the high estimates of cognitive functioning are of a greater magnitude than the estimates of social support. Uh, and, and we can see that the pattern is much more heterogeneous. The mixture of green and orange and gray in this map is much greater than in cognitive functioning. Um, so for example, Compared to cognitive functioning, we have more positive effects throughout uh, Eastern Ontario. We have more heterogeneous high-low mixtures in Atlantic Canada and in British Columbia. So putting these analyses together, we can look at where areas overlap or where areas have high cognitive functioning and 
have high social support or areas that have low cognitive functioning and low social, low social support. So there's about 366 green areas or high, high overlaps, about 200 low, low overlaps, low cognitive functioning and low social support, and the remainder are, are non-overlapping or about 900. So some notable high, high clusters, uh, we can see Victoria, Vancouver, throughout Eastern Ontario, and then there's some clustering here through Atlantic Canada. And some, some low, low clusters, uh, New Brunswick and Quebec, and also these large areas. But recall that these areas are only a handful, one or two areas, just they're very large, so they dominate the map. So giving just a more detailed look, we can see that these clusters uh, in Vancouver and Victoria, to also illustrate the size difference in, in forward rotation areas, that's one of the broader themes running throughout this presentation, is that we're very small forward rotation areas in the urban areas, but very large throughout the rural areas. Same in Ottawa and Kingston, lots of high, high overlaps throughout and not too much in the city. And we've got Calgary, we've got some low, low, uh, low cognitive functioning and low social support throughout Southern Alberta and our surrounding Quebec City. Okay, so just to summarize that first set of analyses, uh, area level effects or sort of aggregating from individuals up to areas are is more important for cognitive functioning than social support. Uh, but two times more areas had different cluster classifications, so high cognitive functioning and low social support, than they had overlapping cluster classifications. And of course, it's challenging to interpret these patterns using the tracking data set. There's a lot of noise because there's not too many people within each area. Um, but there is some evidence of high, high overlapping geographically. Okay, so the next set of analyses, we're gonna look at multi-level spatial modeling. And this is sort of confirmatory. Uh, we're gonna quantify the relationship between social support and cognitive function and account for a handful of individual char characteristics and also the residual variability that's due to being located within a certain forward rotation area. And we apply this in three ways. We're gonna look at uh, the largest six data collection sites. So that is, uh, Calgary, Halifax, Montreal, Vancouver, Winnipeg, and Ottawa. And we're also going to look specifically at Vancouver and we're going to look specifically at Montreal. So guiding uh, this sort of sub analysis, we've got three questions. Is social support associated with cognitive functioning in the comprehensive assessment? And uh, what does this relationship persist after we control for individual covariates like education or age or gender. Uh, the second question is how important are forward rotation areas for understanding this relationship? And more empirically, does including neighborhood or context level effects improve our model fit? And second or third, where are areas with high cognition or low cognition located within data collection sites, specifically Montreal and Vancouver? And does this provide any insights into potential area level risk factors that we could analyze in future research? So here's a map of, of the forward rotation areas included in the data collection sites for Vancouver and Montreal. Uh, note that I've omitted a handful of rural areas with, uh, that were designated rural as per the, the uh, forward rotation area census data, uh, just to make sure that our analysis is somewhat comparable between forward rotation areas such that they're all urban. Um, So uh, in, in, um, in multi-level analysis and in geographical analysis, there's a lot of questions around how do we operationalize neighborhoods? And, and um, just to give you an example, on the left we have forward rotation areas and on the right we have neighborhoods such as they're defined by uh, Montreal planning, so urban planning. And these are relatively uh, larger, the neighborhoods defined by the planning department are relatively larger than forward rotation areas but forward rotation areas are relatively larger than census tracts. And census tracts are the largest or the most common, most commonly used level of analysis at that level two at the context level in multi-level modeling. Uh, here we can see Vancouver uh, and we have a similar insight that neighborhoods as defined by the planning department are slightly larger than forward rotation areas. 
So we can't necessarily say that forward citation areas are not indicative of neighborhoods, but again, this is a question that deserves further discussion and further analysis. So here's the data for a cognitive functioning in Vancouver and Montreal. We've got uh, each site is in purple, and the overall for all of the, uh, the six largest data collection sites is in green. So there's no real differences between, um, between the sites and the overall sample. But we can see that uh, Montreal has more areas than Vancouver. And I'll talk a bit, a bit about this later when we, when we get to the model fit. But this is important when we're considering the multi-level analysis and that more areas provides, you know, helps us improve our model fit. So uh, our covariates include overall social support. That's our of interest. We've got a handful of risk factors there. I'm not going to go over them now, uh, but these are all have been all associated with cognitive functioning in previous work. So here we've got a multiple multi-level model similar to before, but we include multiple risk factors at the individual level. We've still got our between individual variants and our between area variants. And then comparing these two variance parameters helps us understand how important areas are. Uh, note that I have model one, which uses only individual level, and we're going to compare this to model two, which uses individuals and areas. So comparing sort of a single level analysis and a multi-level analysis. So our results are here. We have overall uh, for the six data collection sites in red, Montreal is in green, and blue is in Vancouver. And we can see that the relatively consistent results throughout uh, all the data collection sites uh, that are comparable to overall. Uh, the point estimates, which are the dots, are relatively similar, and uncertainty intervals are smaller for the overall sample because there's more people, and they're slightly larger for the for Montreal and Vancouver because there's less people. Um, so here we have social support positively associated with cognitive functioning. Uh, so is being female and your education level, that's uh, achieving a high school education. And we can also see that gender or age, sorry, as you get older, your cognitive functioning declines gradually. Just give you some point estimates on these parameters. Uh, we have overall social support. All of these uncertainty intervals are overlapping. So we have relatively similar effects between the overall sample or the six data collection sites and the specific Montreal and Vancouver case studies. And this confirms existing research. I'm not gonna really get into it too much more detail because I think I'm running out of time. Uh, our second is age. Uh, we have consistently declining cognitive functioning or negative relationships as age increases, again, consistent with past work. And here we have our positive covariates associated with better cognitive functioning, uh, achieving a high school education, and being female. Uh, one interpretation of, of the gender or female-male difference is that uh, men have less intensive social support networks but more widespread so perhaps it's the meaningful of the social connection that's driving uh, cognitive functioning and not the number of social connections that are driving this relationship. Uh, to our second question drive it, uh, in this uh, set of analyses is does it improve model fit? Is there even a purpose of including this relationship uh, including area level effects? And we can see here that uh, when we include area level effects in Montreal and in the overall sample we improve model fit. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail, but basically we wanna try and minimize the DIC or the deviance information criterion. Here we have D with a bar on top of it. That's sort of the goodness of fit or how much difference there is between the real data that we observe in the, in the survey versus the fitted data coming out of the model. And PD is the number of effective parameters or the complexity of the model. So smaller D bar, we have better matching with the real data and smaller PD, we have simpler models. And we can see that um, this improves adding area level, improves model fit in the overall sample or the six data collection sites and in Montreal, but not in Vancouver. And one reason that this might be is that because Vancouver doesn't have as many areas as in the overall sample and is in Montreal. So we're not capturing as, as much variability at that level. But we can see consistently through all of the samples that our model fit or our goodness of fit, sorry, uh, is smaller across all of the data all of the all of the data collection sites uh, but that this is balanced out by increasing the number of 
increasing the complexity of the model or increasing the number of parameters by adding in that area level effect. Okay, so quickly to summarize, I'm showing the area level results here of Montreal, uh, where green is positive or positive cognitive functioning and purple is low, negative cognitive functioning. Uh, this is the entire study region on the left and a zoom up of sort of the downtown area. Uh, this is uh, Mont Royal, the park. Uh, I've highlighted that there. So we can see here that uh, that many areas in the downtown of Montreal are green, so that's positive functioning. So maybe there's some influence of uh, density or being located close to the city center or resources that are located around there associated with cognitive functioning. And here I've shown Vancouver, uh, the entire city region again on the left, and uh, a zoom up of sort of the city of Vancouver and the downtown area on the right. Uh, and we can see that through uh, Kitsilano, Point Grey, through the center area here, we have high functioning. And on the west side, we have high functioning, but we have low, relatively lower cognitive functioning uh, in uh, um, Gastown and the downtown east side. So maybe that points to some socioeconomic factors influencing cognitive functioning at the area level. Uh, so to conclude, I'm just going to review some limitations, some challenges of doing geographical analysis in the CLSA, and then and then some directions for future work. Um, the first is the size and how FSAs are defined and the internal homogeneity of forward sortition areas. They're constructed for coastal delivery, not for representing health-related processes or exposures. Um, so uh, this is an important consideration to take into account when we're doing geographical analysis in the CLS data. The second thing is, is that uh, little research has specifically articulated the mechanisms through which areas or neighborhoods or geographies influence cognitive functioning. The areas have to come into the body somehow, but we don't really understand how. Um, that's an important direction of future research. And the second thing, uh, the third limitation is how to consider sampling. Uh, and the representativeness of each data collection site, or even within forward sortation areas, how does this compare to the entire sample? I'm going to look at the using weights in future research and, and comparing these subsamples. Uh, so challenges, the first and most prominent challenge is that the most precise geographical information for participants is the forward sortation area. And these are slightly larger uh, in urban areas and much larger in rural areas than census tracts, which are commonly used in neighborhood effects literature, including in neighborhood effects literature focusing on cognitive functioning in particular. The second thing is how do we interpret the variance explained at the area level? Um, they're not directly transferable into interventions because they're capturing residual variability and we haven't included any covariates yet. So that's my next stage of future research is to add covariates, help us understand this. And, and these might include education level or population density or walkability or access to libraries or public transit. That'll help better understand how we can implement interventions and what area level factors are influencing cognitive functioning. And the third thing is common in neighborhood effects literature is the broader social political forces influencing residential location. Uh, and, and tenure and mobility and how people move, how does that influence exposure? Uh, so future research, one of the real advantages I see in the CLSA data is its longitudinal and its follow-up studies. So we can look at how change in cognitive function interacts with change in aerial areas. Uh, if area is gentrifying or we add new services, how does that influence cognitive functioning? I think that's a huge opportunity for this data set that hasn't been done in the past research. Future research also look at the correlation structures between multiple indicators of cognitive function. Past work has found that memory is associated with, so with socioeconomic status, but not attention or other things or other indicators. So that's worth further examination. And, and the second thing is modeling the complex variance. So we assume a common variance, but it could be hypothesized that socioeconomic status influences the mean, area level socioeconomic status influences the mean cognitive functioning within areas, but that also influences the variability. Perhaps there's more people at the high level than at the low level versus in low cognitive functioning. It's more the individual are more dispersed across uh, the cognitive functioning spectrum. And just to revisit the objectives, We've understood the geography, spatial analysis, how it can be incorporated. We've looked at overlapping clusters, and we've also looked at the relationship between cognitive functioning and social support. So I just want to thank uh, Dr. Mark Ormus. Uh, he's the leader of this subgroup of cognitive functioning. Uh, Dr. Colleen Maxwell, Dr. Suzanne Tias, Dr. Holly Twoko, and Dr. Candice Connor. They're all on the team as well. 
Emily Rudder provided an excellent list of covariates uh, that I did use. So thank you, Emily, and Catherine Galley and Shirley Corpus for getting this webinar up and running. Uh, I'm now ready to field any questions. Thanks, Matt. That was really, really a great presentation. Um, oh, I'll open it up now to questions for both uh, Matthew Quick and Dr. Jane Law, who's available for questions, I'm pretty sure. Uh, just a reminder, muting remains on. So uh, I will be reading the questions, but you can enter your questions into the chat box at the bottom right corner of the web WebEx window, and I will read them out. Um, so we have a question, but before we get to that and to allow other people to put some in, uh, I'll go ahead and start off with one. Um, so you talked about the scale of the analysis as your kind of background for using the, the forward sortation area that for most of your analysis, for all your analysis here. Can you can you tell us why you looked at the FSA instead of maybe the census? I mean, not using something else? Sure. Um, so forward sortation areas are the smallest or most precise, most granular geographical information. Uh, and I thought that would be a good start. Past research has um, typically focused on census tracts or neighborhoods. And um, forward sortation areas are the unit within the CLSA that best approximates this. There's no reason why you couldn't do the same sort of analysis using the entire data collection site or entire census subdivisions, uh, although there are some limitations when you want to look across the tracking cohort, for example, uh, because census subdivisions aren't, um, they don't cover the entirety of Canada. So, you're so it's, the most, it's the most granular data available? It, it is, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Yu Long Lang. Um, hi, Matthew. Could you pre please elaborate a bit on the following? How is sample weight used in the spatial analysis? Uh, we haven't used sampling weights yet, but um, that is the next step, as I think I noted towards the end there. Maybe that question came in before that. Um, and looking at the, you know, how the sampling weights uh, partition out between areas, between data collection sites or over forward sortation areas. Do you expect that to make a big impact on the analysis and the outcomes? Um, that's a good question, and I, I'm yeah. afraid I don't really have a very good answer for you right now. And also question two, could you please elaborate a bit on how the predictive variable social support was constructed from its four components? Sure. The concrete uh, support, the fraction, et cetera. Sure, I can flip back in my notes here. Uh, but there is a handful of questions asked each individual along each domain. Uh, and I think they were scaled on one to five, and then um, like a Likert scale. And then the overall social support was the average of those four components. And each of those components was consist consisted of a, a set of questions. Okay, thank you. From Christina Wolfson, there is some evidence of differences in some of the con cognitive test results in the function of language such as English or French. Also in Montreal, there is a very strong association between the location in the city or outside of the city and language. So it might be useful to look at this when interpreting the results from Montreal. It makes sense to maybe look at a language language effect. Okay, yeah. Thank or did you, you con consider that? Uh, I didn't consider it. To the best of my knowledge, I think for cognitive functioning, they were standardized separately for English and, and and uh, and French respondents, but we could include a language, I suppose, and also sort of a. I've been thinking a lot about distance to the city, so outside the city, yeah. inside the city. Um, again, there's a question like, how do you measure distance and to what? But definitely, sure, that's yeah. something that really became evident. From Col Colleen Maxwell, uh, Matt, how do you describe relevance of this work to policymakers in charge of dementia strategy for the provinces? Sure. So um, I would say that, uh, so we've got the individual level analyses, and I assume that the, you know, sort of translation of that into policy is relatively straightforward. Um, but translating the area level results, I would say that um, the first thing is, I would say that uh, we need to look at these areas that have uh, relatively low cognitive functioning or negative associations with cognitive functioning and trying to understand what it is about them. Maybe it has to do with access to services or physical uh, activities or things like that, and think, thinking about what we can do to improve improve that within the areas. Great. 
We have a question from uh, Brittany, Brittany Scarfo. Which software was used for the spatial analysis? Uh, so for these multi-level models, I fit them in WinBugs, uh, which is just like a, a, a Bayesian modeling software from the early 2000s, I think. Uh, you could also fit them in MLWin, or uh, or there's probably an R package to do multi-level models as well. Okay. Uh, we have a question from uh, Nazmul Solhal. Uh, thanks, Matthew, for an excellent presentation. For the regression model, are you using OLS or spatial regression? And what kinds of weight metrics are you considering here? Based on spatial weights, metrics, spatial dependencies may change. Uh, for for comprehensive, sure. we may expect more variability due to small FSA size and area, but we will lose information on rurality. Uh, can you how can how do you address these? Sure. So um, it's. Uh, not fit in OLS, but the results are comparable to if you would fit it using ordinary least squares. Excuse me. Um, I did not include a spatial component in particular. Um, so that would be a parameter that describes a relationship, like a lag or a spatial weight or something like that. Uh, I did try. I did use a spatial parameter, but there was no, it didn't improve model fit. In some cases, it made model fit worse because you're adding an extra parameter, but not gaining any more information from the model. So. Uh, I think one explanation for that is these forward circulation areas are relatively large. If we constrain it to only the smallest, we might see some sort of spatial clustering. But uh, you know, if we flip back to uh, the maps, if we included a spatial parameter, we would expect to see clusters of green, uh, dark green, leading to clusters of relatively less green, leading to white, leading to light purple. You know, sort of a smooth map, and we don't really see that. So um, I think it might have to do with size of the FSA. Uh, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Uh, from Ann Tooney, uh, excellent analysis presentation and very interesting results. I'm curious how well you expect to be able to add covariance to the FSAs, as some may be quite homogeneous while others may be quite heterogeneous in terms of education, income, et cetera. We'll see this in some Calgary neighborhoods, though not in others. Thanks again. Sure, yeah. Um, so uh, we can analyze. Um, Sort of like socioeconomic variables at the individual level, and uh, I think they're included in some of them are included in the CLSA, uh, as well as at the neighborhood level. So um, some will have more variability. For example, uh, access to green space will be really high in some neighborhoods, but really low in others. Perhaps those that are located closer to the city center. Um, so that variability would be entered in, or the variable we entered in at the area level. Um, I, I suspect that some. Uh, like median income, for example, or educational attainment will be uh, not as strongly associated at the area level, or those contextual effects not as large in magnitude as perhaps some of the variables that are more heterogeneous throughout the cities. Yes, that makes sense. Uh, we'll take one more question here from Brittany Scarfo. Great job, Matt. We didn't think the decrease in DIC was large when adding FSA to the model. Was it statistically significant? Sure, so um, the typical threshold used is five points. Uh, anything less than five points is sort of considered the same and anything less or greater than five points difference is, is better. So uh, you can see here that the increase in one, but we have six points and we have uh, 60 points about, I think, uh, more than that, 90 points. Uh, so yeah, we consider these better models overall. Great. And so Mike Ormus, who you, uh, you reference as being a, a collaborator for you, has written a couple of uh, explanatory notes that I'll just read through real quick. Uh, FSA is the only data available in CLSA. The CLSA won't release full postal codes to reserve, preserve confidentiality. Uh, overall, SSA is computed by taking the average score in all 19 questions for the social support module. So a little bit of clarification in addition to the answer to the question on that. And Z scores for cognition were computed separately for English and French speakers. So maybe uh, that, that addresses the, the French speaking question a little bit better. Well, I want to thank you again. Um, it was a really wonderful presentation. I can, I can see that you, um, that from all the questions and the, and the interesting um, discussion we've been having, how, 
how well people have taken it. So thank you again, and we appreciate your participation in the CLSA webinar series. Great, thank you. So I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. The next deadline for applications is June 11th, 2018. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review available data, further information, and details about the application process. Oh, I'll skip to the very end. And I'd like to remind um, everyone that our next webinar is scheduled for next month. We'll be welcoming Dr. Chris Vershaw, an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster University, to discuss age of menopause and its relation to frailty and biologic age in the CLSA comprehensive cohort. So please register soon and join us for next month's webinar. Next month month's webinar will be the end of our 2017-18 webinar series. We'll be taking a break um, for the month of July and August and starting our next webinar series in September. So please join us next month for the end of this year's webinar series. Thank you, everybody.